Yeah. I mean, there's some value to accepting, you know, accepting payment with Bitcoin, mm -hmm. um, you know, because as we know, cryptocurrencies, they're the first, I mean, Bitcoin being the first one, Bitcoin was the first um, asset that had a built-in payment network, right? So to me, mm -hmm. Bitcoin is defined by both the asset, the 21 million cap, hard money, as well as the fact that it has a built-in way of sending and receiving. That's never existed before. There's no money ever on earth that ever came with its own payment network. Um, probably the closest is anything physical. And that, and that payment network was literally your hands transferring it in midair. That was the payment yeah. network, was the physical air between you know, two people exchanging hands. But anything else never came with the payment network. You put, it, you put a payment network on top of it. You, know, you put Visa on top of the dollar. You put Venmo on top of as well the dollar. There's always a layer on top of it where, where Bitcoin had its own payment network. Um, and so, yeah, there's an advantage of using the payment network. You know, uh, if you accept it, you can accept payments from anyone in the world, regardless of whether or not they have access to Visa and MasterCard. Um, but to, from the viewpoint of helping stabilize the currency, I think that using it as purely a payment network and nothing else doesn't help stabilize it. Um, one of the things that I'm looking for in, uh, in helping stabilize Bitcoin is actually using it as um, a medium, not just a medium of exchange, but a unit of account. Mm. That to me is the big, the big transition where I say, you know, I will do this work for you for 0 0.01 Bitcoin, right? Not a dollar amount, a Bitcoin amount. And I think we've, you kind of see that on a very short time horizon when you make a payment. You know, you, for example, BitPay will lock the exchange rate for 15 minutes. So you basically you're creating a 15 minute contract denoted in Bitcoin. The dollar is, is insanely stable because there are multiple countries that have decade long contracts specifically for oil denoted in dollars. They say, we'll pay you this amount of dollars per year for X amount of you know, uh, barrels of oil over the next 20 to 30 years. Now, once you do that, you've now motivated two parties to stabilize the dollar. You know, one side make, wants to make sure it earns enough dollars to pay for that oil. And another side wants to make sure that, that it can pay other things with those dollars. Right? So it ends up being uh, the unit of exchange. And I think people um, disregard the value of being a unit of exchange in creating stability. Um, case in point example, uh, we had a contract developer working for Edge and uh, we agreed to actually pay that developer, not just pay in Bitcoin, but actually quote each task in Bitcoin. So he would say, okay, I'll finish this. You know, I think it'll take me about a month and I'll be, I mean, like I said, like 0.01 Bitcoin or 0.1 Bitcoin. And uh, we're then motivated for that, you know, one month to make sure we have enough Bitcoin to pay that person. So by us having to hodl that much Bitcoin, we've added a little bit of stability to the ecosystem. And if you start taking those contracts and making them longer and longer, 15 minutes being the starting point with a bit pay invoice, hardly any effect, a month starting to have actually a longer effect. Now take that to a year or two years or four years. Once companies start to really, or even individuals start making longer term contracts in Bitcoin, I fundamentally believe that that's going to help stabilize the price because now you have parties that really, really want to keep that stable from their point of view, right? One wants it to go up, but not down. One wants it to go down, you know, and not up. Well, the two kind of counterbalance each other. Yeah, it's a really good point you make. And it's like something that's um, so with one of the, uh, the companies that I've uh, been a part of starting up, we tried to do our accounting um, and we did do our accounting in the early days for the first about eight months in Bitcoin, <laughs> um, which was pretty tough. But um, it tough. was actually really, it was the best thing for us because we had people investing from Brazil, New Zealand and the UK in our respective currencies. So it was actually easier to just say, that Bitcoin is is just yeah it's it's a global currency right so it made that actually very simple. Having said that, obviously you know there was other challenges with that, but um, and oh, we've yeah. now had to switch to, to the local currency um, for the sake of government. But yeah, I wanted to ask you, um, El Salvador, like the Philippines, is a huge remittance market for the U.S. As a Filipino American, have you ever sent money to your family like in the Philippines with Bitcoin, or is it easier to do with Western Union? I have, I have with Bitcoin, but more of just like, hey, here's some Bitcoin so you can see that I actually can send you money overseas with very, at the time, very low fees. So this is, I haven't done that since fees spiked in 2017. So that I haven't done. Um, ironically, it actually is less efficient if you want the native fiat currency. If you have a native fiat currency and you want a native fiat currency, it can be incredibly less efficient. The, there is a bank in the Philippines that has a presence in the US. 
if you have a bank account there or know someone with a bank account there and, and fortunate for at least me and my family, um, we usually know a relative that has a bank account with that specific company. And then you just deposit in the US and that shows up kind of almost instantly over there in the Philippines. So it, it's one of these cases where crossing borders can be fast if you have a centralized entity. So centralization is very efficient. You know, so people really knock that word. It's become like a four letter word in crypto. Oh, centralized, oh, centralized. Um, a, it isn't even well-defined. Like I hate using the word decentralized even. Uh, you'll hear me say this in, in a few talks. I hate the word decentralized. I hate the word centralized because no one agrees as to when you've achieved it, right? All the Bitcoiners and Maxis will go, oh, but Ethereum's you know, centralized. Well, okay, well define that. You know? and, and what does it have to do to become decentralized? And how, how, um, how do you define Bitcoin as decentralized? At, at what point has it become decentralized? It clearly wasn't when Satoshi was the only one running nodes. When did it become that? And no one really defines a threshold. So anyway, so it's, as an aside, I kind of hate using um, those words. But yeah, centralization can be very, very efficient. Right? It can be very corrupt, but efficient. And so uh, if you are fortunate enough to be some of the you know, fortunate part of the population that has access to some of these centralized services, and you're doing a transaction that they approve and you know, are not going to censor, then it's very fast and efficient. And I'm, I was fortunate my family does have access to that. It's when you're in say remote regions of the Philippines or El Salvador, you don't have access to a bank. You're primarily cash-based, um, uh, barely have, there, there's no branch for you to walk into. Then this is where Bitcoin shines. As long as you've got an internet connection, you can, you can transfer value. Converting that into your native currency might be another, another issue altogether though. But I'm assuming in El Salvador, there's a lot of people there that have Bitcoin that want Bitcoin, you'll probably be able to convert it on the streets pretty easily. I should say, well, if you're if you're in the Philippines, there's tons of bit refill gift cards you can get, so uh, you can right. always transfer. Right. <laughs> I had to do the plug; it was too good not to do it. Um, where you nope, can get, sure. you know, <laughs> you get tons of. We've got tons a lot of, of people in the Philippines who love our giveaways. Whenever we do a part, we do we've done a handful of uh, uh, promotions with Bit Refill, saying, "Hey, we'll give you know free pizza cards, blah blah blah." Definitely, quite a few people uh, based out of the Philippines respond on Twitter with interest in some of those promotions because you're exactly right; you can definitely convert those over to cards. In a way, it's kind of a remittance rail. Right, send someone Bitcoin, they convert it into various cards that they can actually use for their day to day life. Yeah, it's true. We've got Jolly B and all sorts. It's always, it's quite funny. I always like seeing oh, yeah. the, the different stuff in other countries. But uh, yeah, well, I, I suppose to take it away from my uh, my shameless plug there, I um, you mentioned uh, Edge uh, Wallet, which obviously is you know uh, a big part of what you've worked on. Um, and last week we spoke with uh, Adam Fixer of Wasabi Wallet and their privacy focused goals and, and the way yeah, that that yeah. wallet was built. Um, and obviously with Edge Wallet, uh, it's a lot of the, the message in your goal um, from my perspective and what I've seen is about securing your customers' freedoms um, to a degree, like keeping things secure, private, like data secure and private. Um, so what is it for you that led to this focus of privacy and security? Um, was it more something that was like aligned with your core beliefs and kind of went along with what you saw in Bitcoin, as you explained before, or was it something that more came about from the perspective of, Hey, you know, we need to build what the people want. And like, you know, there's not enough, uh, while it's doing this, let's, let's, you know, let's care about people's privacy and let's shine upon that and make that our USP. Yeah. So, uh, almost all of my life, I've been a bit more of a private person. Like, yes, I show up on podcasts, I give talks and whatnot, but um, other than Twitter, I'm really on social media. Um, and, and Twitter is, is less of what I consider to be kind of a, a, a privacy exposing social media platform. At least I don't view it as one. I, I think of it as more of sharing thoughts, right? Sharing thoughts that you want to get out there. And that's how I use it. I don't use it to just kind of take selfies and show where I am um, or uh, show pictures of my kids and blah, blah, blah. Like it's, it's a sharing of thought. Um, Facebook, I, I don't even have installed on my phone, right? I, I'll, I'll go there to message people because they're messaging me. Um, and so that's, I think it's just a bit more, a, a bit more a part of my core psyche is that I really like having that choice of, hey, here's what I want public and here's what I want private. I don't think everything in the world can be private. I don't think you can use um, all privacy-based tools for everything we do. And someone, people said, oh, I want like the, the new blockchain-based Facebook, but you know, I own my data and it's totally private. I go, will not ever happen personally. I don't think that will ever happen, right? Those are platforms for sharing things and for getting information and photos and videos or whatever out to the public. So don't ever expect that whatever you put on there is going to be private in any way, shape or form, right? Sure, maybe an individual that's 
three degrees disconnected from you and your friends might not be able to see it, but that data is out on the dark web. Like everything I put on Facebook, I assume is out on the dark web and in the government's hands and whatnot. Um, so those will continue to be that way, but I wanna be able to have my, my financial information private. Right. I, I don't want to be using cloud-based tools that effectively expose all of my financial information to whoever who doesn't need to see it. So obviously my bank will see all of it. I can't stop them from doing that. But why share it with like Intuit, with like online financial applications, you know, quick and online and whatnot. So it's just a bit of more of my core psyche. Now to get, you know, not to kind of throw anyone under the bus, but kind of some of our, our differences in opinion between a product like Edge and uh, Osabi Wallet is that you know, there's incredible high levels of privacy and different angles of what you think are the privacy attack vectors. And you could try to build product that attacks, you know, one, one uh, or it solves one privacy attack vector versus another versus another, and, you know, and whatnot. And our angle is we want to attack the vectors that we can solve with no user experience compromise. That's the fundamental thing. I don't want a user jumping through hoops to gain additional layers of privacy. I want it where someone who gives, gives no no question at all. Like they give no damn about at all about privacy. They're using Venmo and screaming at the top of their lungs from, you know, top of volcano. I just paid Bob, you know, 20 bucks for a foot massage. Like <laughs> those people should be able to use privacy preserving tools and not even know that these are better tools. And so case in point example, like signal really, really blue chunks many years ago. I tried using it. It totally sucked. So I fell back to standard old fashioned, SMS and you know Google Chat and blah 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 all the all the junk, um, which isn't private at all. Um, as soon as Signal improved and it drastically improved over the past two to three years, it's kind of become my de facto go to. And when people ask how can I get how can they get in touch with me, that's my first choice. And it doesn't feel like a privacy based app. You don't really have to know that it's privacy based. It it works pretty seamlessly. And the same thing to me applies to cryptocurrency. I, I both value the applications and the protocols that take privacy by default and hide any of the complexity of privacy. You just use the asset. Like we were one of the first, um, we were actually the first multi-asset app to incorporate uh, Monero. And that I really love because it was the user experience just feels like you're sending and receiving a crypto. There's no, oh, I'm going to go mix my funds now. I'm going to switch manually switch addresses. I'm going to give one address to this person, one address to that person, um, have different wallets so that I segregate funds. And I'm going to pick my UTXOs intelligently. Ugh, like seriously, is that what someone should have to go through for privacy? Um, and not to slam the, you know, the, the Bitcoin maxis out there. I know Sergey kind of is one. So apologize, Sergey. But <laughs> this is kind of like the root issue I have with a lot of the culture in Bitcoin is it's not rooted in user experience. 